Well, good morning, Pine School parents. I'm going to go ahead and get started. And I just want to remind everyone that uh, I am recording this meeting. We'll make the recording available in the nightly news that we link. Uh, we'll include that link on Sunday when that goes out. So if you have any friends who weren't able to be here with us, with us this morning, definitely encourage them um, to watch the recording. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start in my usual way. Um, I want to go through just some calendar highlights that are here upon us. Um, Next week, we do have uh, four days of some homecoming events scheduled for our upper schoolers. Uh, I know that we are going to have to look carefully at what we have planned and what we can continue to host. Um, unfortunately, we've had a, a group of our students who uh, have needed to um, go into some, some at-home learning for a while. They're quarantining, and I'll speak more about that in just a few moments. Um, but we do have uh, some homecoming events planned for next week. We'll preserve what we can, but may have to do a little rescheduling. Next Friday is Professional Development Day, so faculty and staff will be here uh, doing some in-service, but of course students will be enjoying a nice four-day weekend, and then we'll all have Monday President's Day off. Uh, coming up a little bit after that, um, during the week of February 22nd, we um, acknowledge Bully Prevention Week and have uh, lots of character education through advisories around the theme of kindness and standing up for each other and doing what's right in those tough moments. And um, as part of that week, um, Tuesday, February 23rd will be Pink Shirt Day. We won't be wearing our blazers that day because we'll have our pink shirts on and that day does end blazer season. Our next virtual uh, parent coffee will be March 5th. And then looking a little beyond that, the 8th to the 12th, will be off-campus education week, uh, different days for different grades. And then right after OCE week, we'll head into spring break. Um, there will likely be some other events that will pop up along the way, uh, perhaps by grade level. For instance, yesterday and today, our second graders were celebrating um, their Wax Museum project, which culminates their study of uh, biographies. So there are definitely some more events starting to happen through the spring, but as far as school-wide calendar, that's what I'll offer to you briefly this morning. Um, for a little bit of a sports update, our girls varsity soccer and boys varsity basketball teams are all still involved in postseason play. So we wish our Knights uh, the best as they wind up those winter sports. And then we also um, have started our spring sports season and we're um, beginning to like we've got practice underway for all of our spring sports and we'll start to see some spring pork, some spring sport competitions here in the not too distant future. Um, so I do like to include a health update during these monthly virtual parent coffees. And um, just as I did last time we, we got together in January, I offered to you that many Pine families and employees are being impacted by COVID-19. Um, and please remain vigilant. Um, this week, we've had our nurse out again. So Nurse Candace has been home. Luckily, this time, Nurse Lori has been able to be here with us all week. But um, you know, it's just, uh, it's in our community and um, no no fault of anyone's. I think that our families are doing a really excellent job of, um, you know, doing what they can off campus to remain healthy. Um, however, this virus is, it's among us. Um, since winter break, we've had three students on campus who have been positive and required follow-up contact tracing and quarantining. And in fact, we just had um, our most recent case Two days ago, we had a student in the ninth grade who was on campus, and so we had to uh, quickly ask some students to spend Thursday uh, engaged in Pine at home, and then as I could through the day yesterday, was able to do more careful investigation about um, you know where children were and who who was actually going to be considered a close contact. Um, it's always my goal to get students back on campus. I know for many of you, uh, there is a definite, definite preferral um, or preference for having uh, students in, in seats here on campus campus. Um, however, I've just got to follow the regulations that we've agreed to, um, to comply with that we get from the Martin County Department of Health. Um, what we observe, what we find is that, um, you know, mask wearing, social distancing, and hand washing continue to be identified as the best mitigation strategies. So as I read more information and news that comes out about COVID-19 and what we continue to learn about the virus, um, it just, uh, you know, it makes me, um, it makes me um, definitely grateful for the fact that we have not seen COVID-19 spreading on this campus. And I, I think a big part of that is just what we've been consistently doing all year. Um, so those are the health updates that I wanted to offer to you.
And then for a few other updates not related to COVID-19, um, I hope you all had a chance to see the announcement that came out from our development department uh, last week. I shared with this group an update on the progress with our new arts and athletics building and announced um, a really tremendous gift we've had come in from um, John and Debbie Texter. We received uh, just over $1.4 million from them in total uh, from a gift they made last June to the project. And what we'll see happen now is the exterior completion of that building. And hopefully if you've driven on campus, you've noticed the metal siding. Um, uh, the, new, the, the new addition is starting to look more and more like the campus that um, it's joining. So all of that is excellent. Um, our fundraising efforts definitely continue and um, I know that uh, you know we're turning to our community, um, both current parents and and other friends of the school, uh, as we push here and try and get that building um, completed and available to our students. It's going to just transform what we do here programmatically. If you are interested in seeing that building, I would encourage you to reach out to John Boyer and um, between him and me, we'd be happy to uh, make time to walk you through that space. Um, I'll make a little gentle nudge for School Pass. If you haven't downloaded that app yet, I'd love for you to do that and, and consider um, learning to use it. Um, we'll kind of have a little soft launch of it here this year, but next year, you know, expect that that's a, a tool we'll want to make much, much more consistent use of. Um, thanks for your flexibility, letting some of your uh, children come to school in jeans the past two days. Um, I did get that initiative or that that uh, proposal from our 10th grade advisory council. And so um, I had a, a, a this student come and speak to me. Marin Rubenstein was here, the representative from the group, and um, her uh, her main her main struggle was the skirts. You know, so it's not easy to pull leggings or tights on under your skirt if you've got skirts. And we talked a lot about khaki pants and why girls don't like to wear those and et cetera and so forth. But um, what we thought we'd try. Uh, and we ended up with, with two more days where we could um, give it a go, was that if we start the morning below 50 degrees when school opens and it's not expected to warm above 70 degrees, that that would meet the, the cold weather threshold and um, we'd allow all students to wear jeans. So it was fun for the kids and um, I think it might have been fun for some of them to see frost on windshields and grass too. So uh, a little bit of Florida winter. Um, if any of you have had the chance to pop on campus in the morning, you'll notice that our school store in the dining hall is now open most mornings. And I want to thank uh, our parent volunteers for helping us staff that space. Lauren Thomas has been coordinating those scheduling efforts and um, certainly um, anyone we we can put you in touch with um, some of our parent volunteers if you think you'd like to be uh, a volunteer in the school store. But um, we are going to begin to offer hot breakfast items. Um, if kids want those available. Um, and so just know that that's up and running. Um, parents are welcome to park and quickly come in the store if they'd like to. So that's an opportunity that's there for you as well. Um, just a little update on Parents Association space. I'm working right now to um, to return the nice space the Parents Association had in the gym um, where the, the bulk of the used uniforms were originally housed. I, I realized that um, in moving the school store to the dining hall and wanting to you know have a little bit more of a, a I guess a retail look to that space, um, it just didn't didn't work out to have that be a shared space with um, with all the items that we would like to make available to families. So just know over the next couple of weeks, um, we will be helping the Parents Association uh, reclaim that space in the gym and look forward to making used uniforms, used textbooks, and other um, Parents Association activities more accessible to parents. So those are my updates. I'm keeping my eye on the clock here. Awesome. Um, so now I want to turn to um, the next part of the program here and introduce my guests to you all. So today, Jen McDonough is with us. Jen McDonough is our K-8 literacy specialist. And I'm going to give her a slightly longer introduction than some of the other guests I've um, invited into this virtual parent coffee. Um, and I want to do that because you all should know that it's not usual that a school would have someone working in Jen's capacity. So as the literacy specialist working extensively with K-8 teachers, um, Jen really gets an opportunity to, to actively um, offer teachers professional development in the moment, you know, to be in classrooms with them, to be coaching them, to be collaborating on lessons. And um, from her vantage point is able to help us do a lot curricularly to take advantage of the fact that we have kids on this campus learning for 13 years. And so we can um, really, really um, grow students from year to year and have themes continue um, 
from year to year and persist. So ultimately through time, um, I know that our students here are gonna become even stronger readers and writers than they are already. So without further ado, I'm gonna stop presenting so that Jen McDonough can come up here. If you, um, let's see if I can tag Jen. I'm gonna, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I'm gonna see if I can get Jen here. If you highlight her pen, that should bring her um, into the forefront here. But I think I'm I'm good. Can you all hear Jen? Are you good? Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So, I'm uh, to you this morning live from the Knights Nook. We got the fire going. We're warm. We're cozy. This is the space for those of you who don't have um, little ones or little ones that were here when we had the Knights Nook. This is the space for um, K. K-5, we still get some of the fifth graders over here with me a little bit. Um, this is the place where we come and we we cozy up and we read books together almost every single day. So um, this is where they come and read books and all kinds of things. So this is the night's nap. Welcome. And uh, I'm Jen McDonough. I am the K-8 now eight literacy specialist. I made that leap this year, which has been super exciting and a great professional push for me. So I'm really excited about the work that we're now doing you know, even in talking with the high school teachers this year. So uh, I just wanted to take a second and tell you first, like, how did I end up being the girl that does this work, right? Like of all the people in the world, why is Jen McDonough calling herself the literacy specialist? So the my background is that um, I was at the Benjamin School for 18 years, teaching at a lower school and always loved reading, always loved writing, but just doing my thing with the littles and happy and, um, I got my master's degree and started learning more and more about literacy and just like falling in love with it and wanting to do everything I could to learn more and more about it. And in doing that, um, I was fortunate enough to actually, over the past couple of years, write two, co-author two books. One's called A Place for Wonder, Reading and Writing Nonfiction in the Primary Grades. And another one's called uh, Conferring with Young Writers, What to Do When You Don't Know What to Do. And these were all born out of questions that I had as a teacher and wanted to explore, uh, had a lot of success with, and then ended up writing about it so we could share it with other teachers. So in doing that work, I started working with teachers, realizing that like that was the thing that I loved. And then when the position here at the Pine School opened, I was like, yes, that is it. This is my passion. This is what I want to be doing. And that's how I ended up here. So some of you might be asking yourself, what does Jen McDonough do all day at the Pine School? So that's what we're going to answer today. So what do I do? If you ask the kids, they'll call me the librarian, which is super like old sounding. So I am trying to get them to call me the book fairy because I think that that's way much more fun. But I do much even more than that. So I think of my job as having a few tiers. So I'm the literacy specialist as the umbrella. But some of the things that I do under that umbrella is my very first thing is creating a love of literacy. So I don't want kids just to be reading and writing. I want them to want to read and write. And so everything I'm doing and thinking about and, and initiating and talking to teachers about is helping to create this love of literacy for kids. It's easier with the littles. We get into middle school and it's not as great. So like that's where we're kind of like putting our paws into now is like how do we keep this love of literacy going when they start to get all hormonal and cranky? So that's what we're working on. Um, so with students, I'm trying to get this level of literacy going. With teachers, I'm trying to help them support their kids in keeping going this level of literacy. So that's one tier of what I do, and I feel like the most important tier. So reading and writing is everything. The second thing that I do a lot of work with is helping students build their literacy toolboxes. So I'm in classrooms every single day working with kids, but also working with their teachers as that next tier to help them build their literacy toolboxes to help the students build their literacy toolboxes. So we're, um, we're looking at conferring, we're looking at how to get partners to work. Right now we've started a K-8 um, reading notebook initiative where all teachers are trying to dabble with reading notebooks to see what kind of deep thinking we could get our kids to start doing about reading. Um, what are some other things we're doing? So I'll do model lessons. Yesterday I was in fifth grade talking about grammar with the kids, modeling a lesson for Mrs. Allie, and then she and I were debriefing about the things that were working and not working and what we might try next. Um, I'll uh, have teachers watch me confer with kids. We, um, I'll read to kids. I'll do read aloud. They come to the library. We do a lot of deep thinking about books together, working on comprehension strategies. Um, 
the first grade teacher and I have been talking a lot about um, scaffolding instruction and what a shared reading lesson might look like or a shared writing lesson might look like. So Katie uh, Humphreys has been doing a lot of work with that lately. So there's just all kinds of things going on. My day is really kind of a little bit of everything, which is super cool and an amazing thing. So we're trying to build this love of literacy. We're trying to build the literacy toolboxes so kids can get even better and better at that. And then another thing that I do is I bring everybody lots of stuff. So for kids, I'm like constantly bringing them books. Like, what are you into? What do you want to read? Um, the Sunshine State Reading Initiative, if you don't know about that, is something that we do K-4. And um, there's uh, 15 chapter books that the Library Association of Florida has recommended as really great literature. And then there's 10 picture books. So over the past few months, the kids have been setting goals, reading as many books as they can to get ready for the reading celebration that's coming up. So just bringing the kids books, making sure they have the books. If I don't have the books, I go to the Jupiter Library and I get them stacks of books. I just, I get them stuff. I get them the books that they need. I get the teachers the writing notebooks that they needed to start their reading notebooks. Um, for teachers, I'm also bringing them stuff, the books they need to be successful, um, PD opportunities. We have three um, associate teachers right now who are taking a workshop on conferring with readers. So that's happening. Um, the kindergarten teacher, we found this great opportunity for her to do a workshop on um, phonics. Uh, the second grade teacher, Mrs. Um, Hughes, has just taken a really cool thing on nonfiction online and um, also the third grade and fourth grade teacher Miss Lehman has done a whole bunch with the research so she just took a virtual um, course on how to get kids to go deeper into research to get ready for their state project so I'll always be on the lookout for like ways that teachers can grow not just through me but like through outside opportunities bring them the books they need the articles they need so I'll basically go in and say so like what are you working on like what are you trying to get better at and then coach them and bring them the resources they need to get better at that thing so I'm always bringing them lots and lots of stuff. I'm a big fan of bringing teachers chocolate too because the more chocolate I give them, the more they let me come into their classrooms and work with them. So that works too. Another tier of my life at the Pine School is this idea of trying to be the bridge. This is me. Building the bridge, bridges between teacher islands. So teachers can't help it. Like they've got a lot going on and they tend to be on their island. So the first grade teacher is worrying about what's going on in first grade and the ninth grade English teacher is worried about what's going on in ninth grade English. And God bless them, it's the best they can do to survive right now. But I get to be the eye in the sky who overlooks the whole thing and says, okay, so like how can we connect these islands for the kids? So we want to look at I know Stacy's here. We want to look at Will McElroy and we want to say, okay, so as Will travels his journey at the Pine School, what bridge is going to connect him from kindergarten to first grade and then first grade to second grade? What kind of language can we use? It's the same for William. So he's not hearing different things over and over and over again. It's all the same concept. Let's call it the same thing. Um, so being able to build from what's going on from year to year. So we don't want Will to go into fourth grade and have the exact same experience in fifth grade. Like that would not be good. We want to make sure that every year our skills are building. So we do that through um, the checklist that you see that come home with the writing pieces. We do that with the reading checklist. We look at our curriculum and say, okay, how are things growing from year to year to year? So that's my job too, is to be the eye in the sky in terms of curriculum building to say, okay, so how can we connect grade to grade and make sure it's like this one seamless experience for a child going through? And the latest, coolest news is that I was moving on up to the middle school. So this year, Vinny asked me if I would now take all of the work that we've been doing in lower school and start building that bridge from lower school to middle school. So I've started working in um, Amy Alley's classroom and in Kim Yaris's classroom, which has been phenomenal and super fun and super amazing. And um, so just in the past couple of months, we've already done some really cool work um, looking at grammar and looking at their reading standards and thinking about the notebooks that um, they're using to help kids develop that deeper reading comprehension. So that's been the, the newest, coolest thing going on. But I know that there are some high school parents on here going, well, what about my kids? What's going on with the high school? So this is a really cool thing that we are going to be talking about. Now, nobody knows this, but it's going to be trending soon. This is a new initiative called Hashtag Grammar Matters. K through 12, we are looking as an English department team at 
the grammar mechanics that we want a Pine School child to lead with by the time they go to college. We have been revising, we've been talking, we've been working, we have another meeting where we're meeting next Wednesday to really align the grammar mechanics and set really high expectations for our kids and how we're gonna hold them accountable for what they've been taught. So this, our parents are always like, how can I help? What can I do? Well, this is what you can do. We are starting this initiative called Hashtag Grammar Matters. If you have a fifth grader, look at them and go, I heard Hashtag Grammar Matters, and they're going to roll their eyes and be like, ah, Mrs. McDonough. So we're going to be doing this in every grade. I'm telling the teachers that we are going to be holding them accountable for everything they turn in. And as parents, what you can do is not respond to a text or email from your child that is not grammatically, mechanically, or spelled correctly. Don't answer it. And if they're like, hello, hello, question mark, hello, hello, be like, as soon as you can answer me with a grammatically correct text or ask me in a grammatically correct way, I will be happy to help you. So as parents, that is one thing that you could do to help support this new trending initiative called Pine School Hashtag Grammar Matters. So I think at this point, Mrs. Capri has a great example of how oh. this might work in <laughs> your home. I yep. do have a great example. I'm going to unpin Jen here. Hopefully you all can see me back now in the presentation box here. So um, I like true story was here in my office last night, um, getting myself organized for the day ahead and thinking about this virtual parent coffee and how Jim McDonough was going to be our guest today. And um, we'd spoken about hashtag grammar matters. And um, for those of you who have gotten to know me through time, um, I'm sure that you know how important writing is to me. I want our students here to have incredible writing skills when they leave Pine. Um, I'm also you know, a huge reader, lover of books, all of that. And so as I was sitting here last night getting ready for this presentation, um, I ended up having a text exchange with my daughter. Um, now she doesn't know I'm sharing this with you all. I'll uh, leave it to you to see if you maybe will uh, keep the secret, but I'm gonna show you our text exchange. This is an example of hashtag grammar matters in action. <laughs> okay, so can you all see this? Yeah, okay. Um, so here we go. This is Nilla wanting me to stop at the store on the way home um, from work. And um, she says, you know, I said, send me the list. Okay, so here's her list. You can see strawberries, We've got a nice apostrophe going on there. Cherries, no apostrophe, just an S. Um, hello. So here's my, here's my commitment, hashtag grammar matters. I'm not going to buy you anything that you don't spell correctly and write in a grammatically correct way. Headed to the store now. Go get dad's help if you need it. Um, and so you can see her uh, little little text below here. You're joking, right? Um, and then I get an attempt. This is awesome. Okay, so good evening, mom. When you go to the store, still got some lingering apostrophes in here uh, used improperly for pluralization. Um, so if she gets a little nudge from me, I'm gonna get you strawberries and cherries spelled correctly. And then here's the culmination. Um, so, you know, what won't you get me? You didn't say fresh cherries. Okay. So I'm getting you all your items, but you still spelled two incorrectly. So now this is the, the moment at the end. Oh, okay. I see strawberries and cherries was supposed to be strawberries and cherries. Okay. We're still working on the punctuation, right? No, no periods here, but I'll take it. I'll take the spelling correction. So um, that is just a, a little example of, um, of how we can how we can nudge our kids uh, when we've got the time to do it um, to to go ahead and um, to go ahead and try and use their best writing all the time. Uh, and I think through practice, we'll be able to help support those efforts. So I'm going to try and uh, let's see, stop presenting now. I'm going to get us back to our view here all together. And um, I'm still recording, but I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. I know Jen McDonough would be happy to answer questions that some of you might have. So we'll just open it up and, and invite you to come off mute if you've got something um, you'd love to discuss. Jen, it sounds wonderful. I, and Benny, I love the idea about the correct text. Thank you. <laughs> um, my question is, Sydney Troop, who's a fifth grader, would like to go to the library on a weekly basis. Can we factor that into the week? And can they also go to the upper school library? 
<laughs> yes, I can definitely work with fifth grade. Um, sometimes they they get a little too cool for me, so I'm trying to get them over here, and then they're like, uh, "We're in the middle school now, Mrs. McDonough. Like, not <laughs> then, but like, we got to go to our own space, right?" So, um, I will definitely go over there and work with Amy and just say, "Hey, if anybody needs to come over, I know Kim sends some of the sixth and eighth graders over every once in a while when they need a book, or they'll come rushing through and grab one if they don't have one." But a hundred percent, we can definitely work on that. Thanks, Holly. Um, the upstairs library, Benny, you can talk about that, but there's not too much up there right now. Um, it's something that we're thinking about and, and, and percolating on. Yeah. A lot of our upper school resources are digitized. Like we've got some subscriptions that we receive and kids can um, do a lot of searching and, and uh, work for research online, Holly. So I would say that our upper school collection is just really not as robust. Um, and we've got more middle school books, uh, a little bit spread out. Um, so, you know, if you were to go into Amy or Kim's class, Mrs. Alley or Mrs. Yaris's classrooms, you would see a lot of grade level reading in those rooms, uh, organized a little bit like what you see in the night snook. So I don't think that the fifth graders would love drifting to the upper school library right now, but I know that they would love to be back in the night snook pretty regularly and, and also getting books from their teacher. So again, you know, the teachers, both English teachers have got great collections in their classrooms. They pass to kids. Um, it wouldn't be as regular a time as to say like, okay, every day is recess at 10, 15. And that's when they can run in the library because of the rotating middle mm -hmm. school schedule. But they definitely do. Um, they definitely do have the opportunity to go there in their English classes pretty regularly. That was a great question. Jen and I are all for getting more books in kids' hands. <laughs> One last thing. Totally. What about um, library skills, like using a card catalog, some of those old-fashioned techniques. Yeah. Where we don't, does that uh, fall into? That would, be, that would be like research process. And, you know, card catalogs aren't even a thing anymore. Um, it's, <laughs> it's so funny. I just sat and talked um, earlier this week with Nat Osborne. He is the chair of our history department. And some of you might remember him. He was on this virtual coffee um, way back in the beginning talking about, um, you know, developing good discourse in classrooms as we moved into our political season. Um, but Nat Osborne and I had a really excellent conversation about research skills that kids use through time. And again, I know that we'll see it build from year to year, but they really do research projects and they're doing so much online that the, the idea of like going to the card catalog and pulling that out and going and locating the book on the shelf. Um, yeah, it's a little bit of a... Um, a skill that is lost, you know, but I think that I think the idea there, like, you know, would we have kids take, I remember going on a field trip to a really big library, like, a, you know, a university library, um, or even being a graduate student and learning to navigate and navigate the library at, um, at University of California, San Diego. And so I think you make a good point about, is there a library we can take kids to where they can see how to, like, literally go find a book off a shelf? Um, Yep, we'll cover that the same day we teach them how to address an envelope. So we'll, <laughs> we'll put it all together. <laughs> awesome, great question. Just to add to that though, the teachers have been doing a lot more work with um, responsible research because of basically you could go onto the internet and find anything and run into anything. So um, we're really talking a lot in the lower school about responsible search engines, safe search engines, that Wikipedia might not be your best source. You don't want to list that like ranking sources, looking at multiple sources for one piece of information to validate it. So there's a lot of that thought going on um, of how to teach kids to, to do that work digitally because that's going to be their life. Um, I have a quick question about um, if there's any special like reading clubs or writing clubs that you have outside of regular library time to enhance the kids' interest and, you know, yeah. yeah, so that's something we've talked about for um, like when the kids can stay after school and do those classes. I just haven't had enough interest of enough kids to do it yet, but like as I wanted to do like a um, like a wonder like writing club where we just can like write about what we're wondering, what we're interested in, things like that. But that's definitely something that that we could explore for kids that want to do maybe like write a mystery or write something outside of the curriculum. That's a great point and something we could definitely think about as one of those enrichment clubs. And, and when our great. students get a little older, so in um, in middle school, Kayla Berger's got a small group of students working with her now on um, news broadcasting, like trying to create a little weekly, you know, announcement on for video announcement thing for the students here. And then moving into high school, um, we will often see kids eager to do some extracurricular writing um, 
take yearbook. You know, all the copy in the yearbook is uh, right from our students. And we also annually produce a, um, a literary magazine, a student literary magazine. And um, if I'm not mistaken, I think that includes some work K-12. And so that's a wonderful opportunity for kids too, to put together something a little bit more creative. Um, but great question, uh, Erica. And again, Jen and I are always ready to get kids doing more of what they love. So Madeline is in that news group with, mm -hmm. with Berger. Yep. She's also in the creative writing club with yep. Ms. Harleen. Okay. However, because of the way we do clubs, like once every two weeks, yep. everything yeah. is at the same time. Mm. And so for kids who have multiple interests or who want to spend more time on stuff like that. On that academic fun stuff. Yeah. Is there ever like thinking about a book club after school or a writing club after school, is there a way to make some of this stuff maybe extracurricular where we do spend a day after school instead of trying to do it all on that one yeah, day activity period. at the same yeah. time. Let me look into that, Stacey. I didn't realize that those two activities were overlapping on club day. Um, and I'm, you know, I'll ask Mr. Tolliver. I think that it's totally a possibility. Um, you know, the activity period right now is 30 minutes and teachers, we ask teachers for be, to be here from 3.30 to four after school anyway. So I think that you what you mentioned is a really great idea. So let me check it out. Just wanna close by saying, thank you so much for joining us today. It was great to gather uh, um, around this shared uh, shared interest and topic of literacy, especially here at the Pine School as we uh, work diligently, diligently to graduate students who are truly exceptional um, you know, readers, writers, and communicators. So I hope you all have a great Friday. I'm gonna end recording, but I'm happy to stay here if you wanna linger, if there's something else you wanted to ask, I'm, I'm, I won't sign off right away. Thanks so much and have a great weekend.